As night falls, a ship arrives at a buoy positioned a few miles off the coast of San Francisco. The buoy marks a cable stretching all the way to Asia, under 10,000 miles of ocean. It is being hauled aboard for a delicate mission. This is no ordinary cable, and once corralled, it must be handled with special care. Over several hours, layer upon layer of rubber and steel are removed to reveal an extraordinary core, made not of metal, but of a dozen hair-thin fibers of glass. This glass, the purest ever created, has changed the world. Next comes the critical step. The glass from the Asian cable must be joined to another that runs back to the U.S. Under a microscope, the fibers are aligned, then fused. The cable now forms a continuous path for data and information from San Francisco to Shanghai. This network is just the latest chapter in humanity's quest to communicate. An epic tale in which scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs struggle against nature's limits. A journey that has culminated in fiber optics. A technology that marries the spectacular properties of light with the magical transparency of glass. thousand years ago, the only way to send vital messages was to carry them. Urgent news took months to travel across land and sea. Ever since, people have struggled to find a better way. And across the ages, humans have shown remarkable ingenuity. News of the fall of Troy, for example, was relayed with a system of fire beacons that carried a prearranged signal nearly 400 miles from island to island. The news of the victory reached Mycenae in southern Greece within hours. You only send very, very important messages using these kinds of systems to signal the fall of Troy or the arrival of the Spanish Armada. But the problem with that kind of communication is that you have to agree what lighting a fire means before you do it. So you can't send an arbitrary message. You couldn't say, come to tea tomorrow. This was not the sort of thing that most people had access to. It was only the elite, the, the ruling class, the military who were using this sort of thing. This was the case for thousands of years. Until in the 18th century, a French visionary named Claude Schapp arrived on the scene. Seeking fame and fortune, Schapp built a series of giant communication towers With funding from the French government, Schapp constructed hundreds of towers like this one, each adorned with giant arms that could be clearly seen with a telescope from adjacent towers. Because each letter of the alphabet could be represented with different arm positions, specific messages could be sent from tower to tower and relayed clear across France. You could send a message from one end of France to another in a matter of minutes at hundreds of miles an hour, which is much faster than a horse can travel. And this was something that had previously been completely impossible. Napoleon was a great fan of the Schapp telegraph system, and he extended it all over France and down as far as Spain and so forth. In fact, the first thing Napoleon did when he took power was send a message saying, I'm in charge now. But Schapp's system had serious drawbacks. One of the problems with doing something from tower to tower is what happens when it gets rainy, or it's cloudy, or it's misty, and you can't see the signal anymore. And it's not a great idea to have to rely on the weather, because it could be bad for a week or more. You could have snow or hurricanes or winds, and that's not a reliable system. 
For all its flaws, SHAP's network opened up a new era in human communication. But SHAP himself did not fare as well. SHAP seems to have gone a bit strange towards the end of his life. He became very paranoid and was, was concerned that other people were stealing his ideas, that he hadn't been given sufficient credit, and he eventually killed himself by jumping down a well. And soon after, his life work was eclipsed by a better communication technology, the telegraph, which worked day and night, rain or shine. Using Morse code to represent the letters of the alphabet as combinations of dots and dashes, the telegraph took the business world by storm. Knowledge is power. And so if you have a little bit of business knowledge before somebody else does, you have a leg up. And so getting that information quickly from one part of the city, one part of the country, one part of the world to the next part is very, very valuable to business people. By the middle of the 19th century, people who could afford to send telegrams could communicate with lightning speed over long distances, but only on land. The oceans still represented a monumental barrier. Transatlantic messages took several weeks by ship. On some occasions, this delay had deadly consequences. In 1815, British and American forces met in a bloody battle in New Orleans. The fighting lasted for days and left thousands dead. But tragically, the war had ended several weeks earlier. The peace treaty has actually been signed, um, but it's been signed uh, on the other side of the world and the news has not reached the, uh, the soldiers. So this entire battle is a massive and needless uh, loss of life. Such disasters provided inspiration for a radical proposal, a transatlantic telegraph cable. But the Atlantic was vast. At its narrowest point between Newfoundland and Ireland, there was 1,600 miles of open water, in places two and a half miles deep. Entrepreneur Cyrus Field understood the challenge, but viewed it as an opportunity. His main qualification for doing it was that he knew nothing about telegraphy at all. And had he known anything, then he might have just concluded it was impossible and, and not bothered. But he was a businessman, and he could see that there would be enormous benefits and money to be made if you could connect Europe and America. So that's what he set out to do. Field's bold plan, which skeptics said would never work, called for two cable ships, the Niagara and the Agamemnon, to meet in mid-Atlantic, splice their cables together, then set off for opposite shores. Against all odds, the venture succeeded. Queen Victoria and President Buchanan exchanged polite messages. The Queen has much pleasure in thus communicating with the President and renewing to him her wishes for the prosperity of the United States. But a few weeks later, the cable shorted out and went dead. Either they could try to repair it or they could give up and say, we have to lay the cable all over again. And in the early phases, when the cable is a couple of miles below the ocean, there's nothing you can do but just throw up your hands and say, let's... Let's lay another cable because we can't fish it out of the bottom. And the fact that they did try over and over again shows you how important they felt that this transatlantic long distance communication was. Undaunted by the setbacks, Field returned to the drawing board and ordered the cable redesigned. This time, it was manufactured as one giant 2,700-mile piece. Then it was loaded onto the Great Eastern, the only ship of its time big enough to carry 5,000 tons of copper cable. 
In July 1865, the vessel set sail for Newfoundland. But 600 miles from land, the cable snapped and fell to the bottom. Field tried again. And finally, in July of 1866, after some 12 years of effort, he achieved his dream. From then on, the two continents would never be separated. Field went on to other ventures, but bad investments and corrupt business partners lost him his fortune. In 1892, he died a pauper. For all the success, however, there was a fundamental problem. Only one message could be carried on a wire at a time, and telegraph companies simply couldn't string enough cables to keep up with demand. So inventors looked for a way to stuff several signals onto a single telegraph wire. One such innovator was a teacher of the deaf named Alexander Graham Bell. Bell came up with a novel idea for solving the capacity problem, a process called multiplexing. It was like sending telegraph signals as different musical notes. Let's say Uncle Dudley wants to talk to Aunt Millie. Well, Uncle Dudley's on this note. You can send his signal on one note here. You can send another signal on this note here. And we can encode them together. We can multiplex them together as two notes. Bell quickly realized that this trick of combining messages on the same wire had much bigger implications. Implications that went far beyond the improvement of the telegraph. He discovers, almost by accident, as he's tuning up his multiplexing telegraph set, that a voice can also be sent along the wires. And being the kind of guy he is, because he grew up in a family where his father and he had taught the deaf how to speak, he's very keen on the idea of speech. Other inventors have also discovered that you can possibly send a voice over a wire, but they consider it to be just a toy. But Bell says, I'm going to experiment more and see if I can really make something that really works. And he does go ahead and he does literally get to the patent office a few hours before his competitor. And so he's credited with inventing the telephone. Believe it or not, in the earliest days of telecommunications, there were many people who thought it would never catch on. Telegraph did just about everything they thought would be necessary, and in the earliest days, some folks actually laughed at Alexander Graham Bell because they said, who would possibly want a device that would allow you to talk from one room to another, from one side of the city to another, or even from one state to another? But the telephone did catch on. First in cities, and then across America, public demand became insatiable. Ironically, the telephone's inventor thought there might be a more elegant way to send messages, one that avoided all the unsightly cables. In 1880, Bell patented a new communication device, based not on wires and electricity, but on mirrors and light beams. He called it the photophone. Hundred years before the laser beam, he thinks about using light to communicate through the air where people can speak over a light beam. It was an extraordinary contraption with a microphone that made a mirror vibrate as a person spoke. Come here, Mr. Watson, I need you. Sun shining on the vibrating mirror was reflected in different directions by the speech. This modulated light carried the message through the air to a receiving station. Bell's receiver used a newly discovered element called selenium, whose electrical resistance changed with light. The selenium turned the flickering light into electricity, which drove a small speaker. Come here, Mr. Watson, I need you. He was really experimenting with wireless communications the photophone was wireless. And Bell was really excited about this. And he wrote a letter saying, 
I have heard a ray of the sun laugh and cough and sing, and he was just so happy about this. Despite Bell's enthusiasm, his photophone, which needed a clear and uninterrupted line of sight, was dismissed as impractical. But Bell's concept of talking with light beams was a brilliant idea. It was just a century ahead of its time. Before light could be harnessed for communication, scientists would need to find a way to guide it, just as they channeled electricity through wires. Even in Bell's day, some physicists had an inkling of how this might be done, although they were largely interested in the principle for its entertainment value. The phenomenon was called total internal reflection, and it was used to wow audiences by showing how a light beam focused into a jet of water would follow the curve as it fell. There is some interesting science behind this optical magic. Light travels more slowly in water than air, so when it reaches the water-air boundary, it speeds up and gets bent. At a certain angle, the light ray is bent so much, it is reflected back into the water. It's a beautiful demonstration. The light's hitting a boundary between water, in which it travels slowly, and air, in which it would travel fast. And it bends so ferociously that it reflects perfectly off the surface. And so every time the light tries to escape from this spout, this sort of column of water heading down, it reflects perfectly and it follows the water all the way until the water hits the bottom. A century later, total internal reflection would help enable unlimited global communications. But in Bell's day, it was just a parlor trick used for public science lectures and to illuminate fountains. The time isn't quite right and the technology isn't quite right to stick all this together and the, uh, the, you know, the, the need isn't there. The world wasn't quite ready for communication with light. But meanwhile, the telephone continued its spread across America and the world. And at the dawn of the 20th century, the telephone was joined by another breakthrough technology, radio, which opened up a new chapter in the history of communications. It was a means of transmitting large amounts of data without the need for copper wires. Part of the beauty in radio is that you can transfer information from one site to another without having to, to run wires between them. It just goes right through the air. The radio wave itself is just a pure electromagnetic tone, and there's no information on that. The information is in whether you turn on and off the tone. So if you can wink on and off a radio wave, a person at the far end can observe this winking with equipment, and you can convey information. Like a telegraph signal, which sends messages as dots and dashes, a winking radio wave encodes information into on and off. The faster it is turned on and off, the more information can be encoded. Initially, engineers used low frequency waves that could send simple Morse code messages for hundreds of miles. These waves were enormous and could flow over trees and hills as if they weren't there. However, the low frequency radio waves could only carry small amounts of information because winking them on and off too fast destroyed the wave. To get around this problem, engineers began using higher frequency waves. These could be winked on and off faster, allowing much more data to be transferred. If all you want to do is say that you arrived safely, you can use uh, a few dashes and dots will solve the problem. But if you want to convey something like sound information, uh, your favorite symphony, your speech, you have to put a lot more bits in per second to this radio wave in order to convey enough information that they at the far end can recreate the speech or the symphony. 
Frequencies vibrating thousands of times a second could transmit music through the air, giving rise to personal radios. And waves vibrating millions of times a second could carry television pictures directly into people's living rooms. The world of in-home entertainment was now a reality. But the high frequency waves came with a significant downside. As the frequencies got higher and higher, the waves got correspondingly smaller, meaning they couldn't travel as far. But as you get to smaller and smaller waves, like microwaves, which have wavelengths like this, uh, little objects, little obstacles become very important. And you have to be able to see clearly from the transmitter to the receiver, otherwise you lose the wave. In 1962, AT&T launched a tiny satellite called Telstar, giving it the ability to bounce radio waves between continents. 170 pounds of complex electronic equipment that receives signals beamed from Earth magnifies them 10 billion times and rebroadcasts them back to Earth. The great hope was the telecommunication satellite. Put a satellite up and then bounce signals from one part of the world to the other because this satellite can see New York and it can see London. It sounded like a great idea until you tried it. While the satellite's lower frequencies didn't get blocked by the weather, users complained about the cost and the annoying audio delay. How do you hear me? How do you hear me? Coming through nicely. Coming through yeah, nicely. Well. The problem was that it took a quarter of a second to get up and back. But it throws your timing off. It throws all the cues off. People didn't like it. It's annoying. It's uh, like talking through a tunnel. Satellites also proved difficult to launch. When they worked, however, they did allow for better communication than the underwater telegraph. But another device invented in 1958 would soon provide a far superior option. It was called the laser. The laser was an unparalleled source of light. When Bell Labs sought a patent for it, few realized it would transform communications. Instead, scientists envisioned a multitude of other applications. Lasers produced narrow ordered beams, vibrating with a single pure frequency. This meant that the beams had incredible precision and could be narrowly focused. Depending on their size and power, lasers could be used for everything from cutting metal to scientific research. But the laser's greatest impact would be in the field of communications. Because lasers could be winked on and off so fast, they could carry enormous amounts of information. But there was one familiar problem, the weather. Once again, we have the same problems that we've had for centuries with communications through the air, the air itself. It could be wet, it could be rainy, it could be cloudy, it's going to block a laser beam. So you have to invent a way of encapsulating that laser in some sort of wire. Wires are clearly not transparent to light, so, so you're not gonna do very well using a conventional coaxial cable with a laser. You have to have something that's transparent, and something that's very good at conveying the light from one end to the other. The answer lay in the Victorian parlor trick called total internal reflection. For if a light beam can be guided by a water spout, the same trick should work with a more practical transparent medium, glass. Glass had the ideal properties to carry light, just as copper wires carried electricity and coaxial cable carried radio waves. 
But curiously, the first to take advantage of this ability were not communications engineers, but doctors. Doctors who desperately needed a way to see into their patients' stomachs. During the first half of the 20th century, they got by with rigid, painful gastroscopes, essentially hollow tubes fitted with angled mirrors. But in 1956, for a physics project, a college freshman at the University of Michigan named Lawrence Curtis set out to build a more humane instrument using thin, flexible glass fibers. He found that the individual fibers could transmit a tiny image over a few feet. But when he bundled the fibers together to get a bigger image, he encountered a surprising setback. I packaged it up and then went to see what the image looked like to find out whether I had broken very many fibers. The startling thing was that uh, there was no image. It had all washed out. We took it out of the tubing and grabbed the fibers and squeezed the fibers together. You could just see light was leaking from one fiber to adjacent fibers. Curtis soon discovered what was wrong. When each fiber was surrounded by air, total internal reflection kept the light beams inside. But when he squeezed the fibers together, the effect vanished and the light leaked out. Curtis also found that scratches and finger oil had a similar effect. The problem seemed insurmountable, but then he had an inspired idea. Instead of air, why not surround the glass core with an outer layer of even purer glass? This layer would perform the same function as the air, making total internal reflection possible with multiple fibers. Total internal reflection it doesn't depend on air itself. It depends on the light speeding up as it enters a new medium. Air is just an example. But if you can put a glass layer, a cladding around the fiber, something in which light travels very fast, faster than in the core, you can still get total internal reflection. The reflection is truly perfect, and you can go through thousands or millions or even billions of reflections with essentially no loss at all. So Curtis reasoned that if every fiber was surrounded by even clearer glass, they could be bundled together into a working gastroscope without losing light. Taking a tube of ultra-clear glass for the cladding and a rod of slightly less clear glass for the core, Curtis prepared to draw the individual fibers. I remember going over to the chemistry stores and getting a piece of standard laboratory tubing, and took it back to the lab and rigged it up in the uh, fiber pulling apparatus. packed out of the room and into the hallway and down to the end of the hallway, which had to be 40 or 50 feet away, and through the end of the fiber, I could still see the glow of the furnace. This was the first time I'd seen it over that length. After pulling many fibers, Curtis built a working gastroscope. Within a few weeks, it was being tested on a patient in a local hospital. This was phenomenal. This was one of the few times in my life when I knew that uh, I had something that uh, was truly going to be uh, significant. Within a decade, fiber optic endoscopes had become a routine part of medicine. Okay, sir, now set to do this. For patients like Sam Verderico, who must have stents removed from his pancreas, there is no need for an invasive operation or general anesthesia. Fully awake, Sam will be operated on by Dr. Carr Locke, who will use a fiber optic bundle to scope his digestive tract. Just get you comfortable like that. Mm -hmm. The whole field of gastroenterology changed in the late 60s and early 70s when endoscopy really came in. 
and allowed us to do things without surgery for the first time. I'm going to place a plastic ring between your teeth. That's going to stay there throughout the procedure. All right. We'll hold it there for you. The fibers themselves are absolutely tiny, and there may be many thousands of them in a bundle that perhaps is only a few millimeters in diameter. The fiber optic bundle is completely flexible. OK, sir, let's make a start. The most uncomfortable part of this procedure is right at the beginning. The flexibility of the endoscope allows us to get into parts of the GI tract that were not accessible before endoscopy came along. So we're passing through the esophagus. Here now is the stomach. Most of the patients that we both diagnose and treat are treated as outpatients. So they walk into our unit, they have their procedure done, and go home again afterwards. Today's gastroscopes allow surgeons not only to see, but also to operate. The tube that carries the fiber optics has a channel for specially designed instruments. This is a loop snare that's angulated so that it allows me to grab a device like a stent close, please. All right, I'm going to pull that up through the channel. By the late 1960s, sending light down a fiber optic endoscope was commonplace. But the real revolution, the one Bell had dreamed of a century before, was yet to come. Because if fiber could transmit images from inside the body, in principle, it could also carry pulses of laser light across the globe. Light so pure, it could encode colossal amounts of information. But one final challenge remained. For long-range communication, the fibers would have to be almost perfectly transparent, vastly clearer than any glass ever made. Glass in a window looks clear. But turn a pane of ordinary window glass sideways, and you see it looks green and murky. There's iron in there. There's copper in there. There's all sorts of stuff that absorbs light if the light goes too far. What you needed was a glass that was very, very pure. The dream of optical communication called for flawless glass. Glass so pure, it would transmit light over a kilometer, exceeding the maximum distance radio waves could travel down coaxial cables without amplification. One of the scientists trying to realize this dream was Peter Schultz. This was a real daunting challenge. Even the purest glasses that they could make into these fibers could go no further than roughly 10 feet, and then the signal would be lost. And really, no one knew if it could be done. In the late 60s, Schultz, Don Keck, and Bob Maurer set out to make it happen. Ironically, the trio worked for a company better known for cookware than communications, Corning Glass in upstate New York. The obvious approach was to take the clearest glass available and purify it even more. But team leader Bob Maurer suggested a different approach. Instead of using conventional glasses, which were easily melted but difficult to purify, he thought maybe we could use a simple glass, which was fused silica. It's the highest temperature glass known to man very difficult to melt and very difficult to draw into fiber into process. Unlike ordinary glass, fused silica is made of pure sand with no additional chemicals to help it melt at lower temperatures. Previously, Corning had only used it for special projects like large telescope mirrors. Now the trio used it to make optical fibers. But they soon hit a roadblock. The rod and tube method Curtis had used to make endoscope fibers just wasn't clean enough. When you put a rod and a tube together, you trap various kinds of dirt and uh, pockets of uh, air which generate bubbles and so forth. So that there are a lot of those things scattering the light out as it travels down the fiber. So the team came up with a radical solution. Dispensing with the glass rod, they made a core by spraying fused silica, combined with tiny amounts of impurities, 
onto the inside of a glass tube. The particles were so small that, in fact, it looks just like smoke from a cigarette. Well, we needed to direct these particles into the tube itself to get them to stick to the inside wall. And the soot initially didn't go in at all. But uh, one of us, I uh, don't remember now who, uh, spotted an old vacuum cleaner that existed in the corner of the uh, laboratory. And we attached it to the other end of the tube, turned it on, put the face of the tube into the torch, and sucked the smoke into the tube to coat the inside wall. And it worked. <laughs> the genius of the idea was that when the tube was heated and drawn, it collapsed into a minuscule fiber of solid glass. The sprayed coating became the actual fiber, surrounded by the clearer fused silica cladding. The core would carry the laser light. The surrounding cladding would ensure total internal reflection. By 1970, the team's fibers could carry laser light a kilometer, beating coaxial cables. By 1975, even purer fibers carried light 10 kilometers, and the distances have been rising ever since. Today, optical fibers are manufactured essentially the same way. But to create the millions of miles needed, they are produced in tall buildings called draw towers. After the core particles have been deposited onto the inner surface of the tube, a glass object called a preform is produced. From this one preform, 150 miles of glass fiber can be made. What happens next is a mixture of high technology and gravity. First, the preform is taken to the top of the draw tower. Then it is clamped in place and lowered into a furnace heated to over 2,000 degrees Celsius. In the intense heat, the tip of the preform starts to melt and begins to fall. The tube collapses on itself. The inner surface coating shrinks down to become the tiny core that will carry the laser pulses. The outer tube becomes the cladding. As the glass drops, it becomes thinner and thinner until it reaches the diameter of a human hair. But the fiber remains flexible, strong, and incredibly clear. This glass is so pure that if the ocean were as transparent as this glass is, you could see the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. It's a depth of about five, five kilometers. By the mid-1970s, it was clear three scientists at a glass company had made the breakthrough many had thought impossible. Bell's dream of communicating with light was now a reality. A single fiber of glass could carry the same amount of information as all these copper cables combined, tens of thousands of phone calls, and it could carry them for many miles. This was the holy grail of telecommunications. Over the next two decades, millions of miles of fiber optic cable were produced, replacing a century's worth of copper wire. Ships like the Global Sentinel completed a highway of glass encircling the Earth. To date, such ships have laid an estimated 4 million miles of glass fiber under the world's oceans, enough to cross the Atlantic a thousand times. And another 300 million miles crisscross the continents, forming what has been called the glass necklace of communications. But just as skeptics had once questioned the telephone, there were those who doubted the need for all the new capacity. The naysayers were soon proved wrong. So here you've got all this capacity looking for a home. I mean, what can we do with this? And almost coincidentally, to the rescue comes something they'll later call the internet. 
Today, the Global Glass Network carries not only ever-increasing internet traffic, but also the data for worldwide commerce and banking. It also connects telephones around the planet. Even in the age of cell phones, a call travels only a small distance through the air to the near cell tower before continuing its journey as laser pulses down glass fibers. Fiber optics lies at the center of a stunning convergence of communication technologies. On a typical business day, we'll handle approximately 300 million voice calls across the network, and we will handle 1,700 terabytes of data. That's basically the printed contents of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., every 17 minutes. Despite all this chatter, fiber is so cheap to make and lay that the world soon had far more than it knew what to do with. Supply outstripped demand, and the industry was poised for a fall. In 2000, the telecom stocks crashed. But experts agree that this downturn was just a growing pain of a new technology, that people will soon find new and novel uses for all the extra capacity. And there are already glimpses of what some of these uses may be. Once again, medicine is leading the way. interactive experience. While everyone else is watching one game, you could be watching two. Plus, player isolation cameras. Tactical views, like you'd see at the stadium. And highlights. While everyone else is watching one game replay, you could be watching five. While everyone else can only talk to those around them, you could be talking to the world. While everyone else waits for the news, you get it as it happens. Astro's new digital interactive viewing for the World Cup. Bigger, better, bolder than anything you've ever experienced before. Welcome to a whole new World Cup, only on Astro. You love downloads? You enjoy chatting with your mates? You love concerts, gigs, and music. So Hit Free Club is totally your thing. Join the Hit Free Club and get unlimited access to downloads, ringtones, wallpapers, chat with your favorite hits out of MPKs and DJs, and a whole lot more. To register, send on Space Free to 33888 or log on to www.hitsfree.com.my. Get your free con and subscribe to Hit Free Club now. For over 40 years, we've been at it. More than 124 Emmys later, we're still at it. Out there, in the field, filming, directing, and producing the programs that are synonymous with quality, synonymous with storytelling, synonymous with the name National Geographic. These are special programs. National Geographic proudly presents the documentaries that have set the standard for an art form. These are programs you should not miss. These are the National Geographic Specials, next on the National Geographic Channel.
North Bay, a town in northern Canada, is the scene of a remarkable experiment. Howard Longfellow needs a difficult operation to prevent his stomach contents from leaking back into his esophagus. The procedure is done through a series of tiny incisions using a fiber optic laparoscope and specially designed surgical instruments. Few surgeons at small community hospitals have the skills and training to do this advanced operation. But today, the local surgeon, Dr. Craig McKinley, will have some unusual support. Are we live with audio and video downstairs? Yes, we are. And we're live with audio and video to Hamilton? Yes, we are. Morning, Marin. How are you doing? Morning, Craig. Mehran Anvari is one of the world's top laparoscopic surgeons. His hands have performed hundreds of these procedures. Today, he sits in a special room on the outskirts of Toronto, nearly 250 miles away from North Bay. Connected by high-speed fiber optics, he is waiting and watching as Dr. McKinley readies the patient. For the people in North Bay, um, I'm sure um, everyone has some idea what we're going to do today. We're going to collaborate to do a, uh, an anti-heartburn surgery on a, on a young male who has really quite disabling gastroesophageal reflux disease with heartburn. And Dr. Invari will be some 350 kilometers away in Hamilton. And then I'll be here in North Bay. Anvari is not simply going to watch and advise. Thanks to the marriage of fiber optics and robotics, he is going to operate as well. Okay. Interesting, there was a little vessel there. Over the next 90 minutes, the two surgeons will perform a tricky dissection then wrap a portion of the stomach around the esophagus to prevent stomach acid from being regurgitated. Can Aesop move in? Aesop. Move in. This technology allows me to feel as if I am in the operating room in North Bay, sitting near the patient, performing a, a standard surgery. It allows us to connect uh, teaching hospitals to smaller community hospitals, to allow the surgeons in these community hospitals to perform technically advanced surgical procedures with confidence and with assistance and support from experts. What we have done is to show that uh, surgery is possible at long distances. Um, could be hundreds of kilometers, could be thousands of kilometers. They are connected. It's very much like where internet was uh, a couple of decades ago. This is a really a network for medical and surgical care. Now that the concept has been proved as a viable option, interest is growing. The military has approached Envari for more information, and NASA is even exploring the possibility of doing remote surgery on the space station. It's quite a large fat pad, isn't it? Remote telesurgery suggests that the next chapter in the story of fiber optics may take us beyond what we think of as communication. In addition to talking, listening, and watching, we will be able to act at a distance. And if history is any guide, fiber optics dominance of communications will only be temporary. Like most technologies, it will turn out to have limits. Limits that drive inventors to develop something even better. The lesson of history is that sooner or later we're going to find some new, better way and then it's going to enable us to go faster than the speed of light or some, some great breakthrough like that and then all of this will start all over again.